Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome, everyone, to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and it is July 23rd, 2018. Now, look, I know that these days there's no shortage of things to worry about or concern yourself with, and I'm not seeking to add to that list. I simply want to reshuffle their priority, maybe, so that you are focused on the right ones in the right order. Unfortunately, the Western media does a spectacularly good job of getting people to worry about the wrong things in the wrong order. Things that are of absolutely no importance to your life or potential future are placed at the very top of the national concern list, while things that are actually very troublesome and deserving of our collective highest attention and your own personal attention somehow get excluded almost entirely from the conversation. As a reminder, my PhD is in neurotoxicology from Duke, but there's no department of neurotoxicology at Duke, so my degree was housed within the Department of Pathology. So I took all the usual courses for that uh, department, including microbiology, which includes the study of pathogenic bacteria and viruses. Now, the 2017 to 2018 flu cycle was a bad one for the world and in the United States, the worst in a decade, with many more deaths from the flu than usual, but also still very far from the worst flu season on record, several orders of magnitude away, which remains of course, the 1918 flu epidemic. Today's guest is John M. Berry, the author of the fantastic book, The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, an accounting of the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed more people in 24 months than AIDS killed in 24 years. John is the author of four previous books, including Rising Tide, The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927, and How It Changed America, a book so well-researched and written that John has considerable influence on both pandemic policy and flood protection. He lives in New Orleans, and we're talking to him today from Washington, D.C. Welcome, John. It's a real treat to have you on the program with us today. Well, thanks very much. A pleasure to be here. Listen, John, I want to jump straight in. uh, And first, right here, right at the top, what is a pandemic? What's the definition? And uh, what's the chance of the world experiencing another pandemic, say, in the next five years? Well, a pandemic is uh, simply a worldwide spread of uh, an infectious disease, as opposed to an epidemic, which is localized or regionalized. Uh, The odds in the next five years are impossible to calculate. Uh, You know, we've had multiple pandemics in terms of influenza. There have been at least 12 in the last 300 years. Uh, Sometimes they've come 11 years apart, sometimes They've come 40 years apart. Uh, There could be a pandemic that's already started that we don't know about. might not be for another 100 years. It's uh, totally random. All right. Well, when we're talking about a pandemic, I think we're we're usually talking about viruses, um, not bacteria. Uh, Is is that absolutely correct? And and um, and how do you explain to people the difference between virus and bacteria? Because I know sometimes people uh, get the, the microbiology a little confused at times. Yeah. Well, first, of course, if you, you know, the bubonic plague in the Middle Ages would certainly qualify as a pandemic. And as you know better than I, that uh, that was a bacteria. It is one that today we can control. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's not I mean, it's threat in local outbreaks. uh, But but in general, it is certainly not a pandemic threat. Uh, A bacteria is a living organism. Uh, Virus uh, is sort of on the edge of life. Uh, it doesn't really do anything except reproduce itself. It doesn't eat. It doesn't have sex. Uh, it doesn't expel waste. Uh, it, it's just a, a one, you know, integer or one increment uh, above uh, a chemical. Really, uh, it needs another cell to replicate. Uh, it invades another cell. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, one in our bodies or for that matter, uh, in, in, uh, it could invade a bacteria, uh, and it takes over the cells, uh, manufacturing processes to make more, more viruses. Uh, 
Great description. I remember uh, we got into uh, some debates uh, back in, in, in school about is a virus a living thing or not, but it's a piece of genetic code. It's got a capsule. That genetic code could be mRNA, could be DNA, and it goes in, injects that into a cell, takes over the machinery, off it goes, and but just makes more of itself. I love how you described it. It doesn't eat. It doesn't excrete. It just, just makes more of itself. Um, and of course, the bacteria that were responsible for the bubonic plague, also, we would put bacteria into tuberculosis. We'd put it into leprosy. There are a few things out there, but viruses... Those those are the ones that uh, really sweep through, create the flu, the flu often killing people uh, because it takes over your machinery to an extent that you, you die from pneumonia or some related thing like that. So let's let's talk about the 1918 pandemic. How did that start? How did it spread? Please take us through some of that gripping story, would you? Well, there I mean, the all influenza viruses, all of them have a natural reservoir in birds. So. In a way, they're all bird viruses, hmm. but it's one of the fastest mutating viruses in existence. Uh, and that mutation rate, I'll give you one example. When a single influenza virus invades a single cell, uh, generally from six to 24 hours later, when that cell explodes, it will expel between 100,000 and 1 million viral particles. I call them viral particles, not viruses, because it mutates so rapidly that 99% of those particles cannot function as a virus. They're incapable of infecting another cell. That still leaves 1% anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 from that cell, which can infect other cells. Um, but that mutation rate will give you an idea that every single permutation of that virus uh, will be produced. So. If that virus randomly comes, if a virus that is capable of infecting mammals or humans uh, comes in contact with a human cell, then that's one way the virus uh, can jump species. But the more common way is, you know, the virus has been around for a long time. It infects essentially every mammal. Uh, pigs happen to have receptors which can bind both to human influenza viruses and to uh, bird viruses. So if a human virus and a bird virus happen to infect a cell in a pig, or it could happen in another mammal as well, uh, but pigs are particularly susceptible, uh, then the virus can swap genes. One of the things that's unusual about the influenza virus is instead of its genetic information being carried on a continuous strip of genetic material, there are actually eight separate segments that carry the genetic information. So if you get two different viruses infecting the same cell, these segments, it, it, imagine sh shuffling two different decks of cards and, and uh, shuffling them together and counting out one new deck, then you can create a new virus. Uh, and, and that would, could be one that would uh, be capable of binding to human cells and also have enough of a different virus that it would be essentially invisible to the immune system. Uh, and those are the two ways you get pandemic. So you get a new influenza virus infecting a human population when the immune system has not seen that virus before and is not prepared to naturally fight against it. So it will spread very explosively, much more explosively than seasonal influenza. So John, what happened in 1918 then? It, uh, as I understand the story, it's, it's thought to have begun in Kansas. Uh, how did that, what happened there and what kind of a virus was it? How, how's that one classified? Well, you know, it's a, it's a good question. We don't really have the answer to it even now. Um, I think at this point, I was one of the uh, earliest or, you know, advocates of, of a Kansas beginning, but I'm not sure I, uh, feel that way myself anymore. There's mm -hmm. been a lot of, the book came out 15 years ago. There's been a lot of work since then. Uh, and I'm not convinced of Kansas at all, but nobody knows where it did begin. It could have begun in Kansas. Uh, the latest work suggests uh, there are, there are, uh, 
eight segments in the virus that each of which carries, uh, uh, well, some there, there are more than eight genes, but not a lot more. Uh, the latest work suggests that seven of those eight segments uh, came immediately from a bird virus and that the eighth segment was a little bit older than that. Uh, so it wasn't quite entirely a bird virus that jumped to humans. There, there was some mixing, probably. Uh, but again, that's not conclusive. That's only the latest work, and that could be proved wrong tomorrow. Uh, so, so there is a, one of my best friends and influenza experts, uh, Mike Ostrom, puts it. He knows a lot less about influenza today than he knew ten years ago. <laughs> well, uh, there's been a lot of yeah, there's been a lot of work. And a lot of the things we thought we knew uh, have, have proven wrong, actually. Well, isn't that the way of the world? I know a lot less than I used to as well for the same reason. The more, the more we learn, the more confusing, uh, the more elegant. I don't know how you want to put it. It's astonishing. So this, uh, but the, in 1918, this, this uh, virus uh, really spread and it, it swept through the world. Do we know how many people were, were killed? And, and also just a fascinating part of the story is who it claimed as its victims. Take us through that. Right, right. Well, first, the death toll was horrific. Uh, probably the lowest modern estimate uh, is 35 million dead. And I think there's been a general consensus that it's at least 50 million and may have been 100 million. So if you adjust for population, that would be the equivalent of 225 million to 450 million people killed today. Hmm. Uh, is amazing as N plus, most of these people died in a matter of probably about uh, 16 to 20 weeks from uh, September to uh, early January, September 1918 to early January 1919, just an incredibly short period of time. So it was very, very intense experience. Unlike seasonal influenza, which uh, tends to kill the elderly, chiefly because they usually have weaker immune systems, uh, this virus killed otherwise healthy young adults, uh, probably about two thirds of dead uh, were somewhere between 18 and 45 years old. And those are people who normally do not die from infectious disease because they have the strongest immune systems. Uh, hypothesis is that the immune systems themselves overreacted to the virus. The immune system has many, many very toxic weapons, and the battlefield was the lung. So in an attempt to kill the virus, they tended to destroy the lung. That's, that's one of the hypotheses as to why young adults die. Uh, there, there are others that get pretty complicated. Uh, that's, I think, the leading hypothesis. Um, the symptoms could be horrific. Uh, you could bleed not only from your nose and mouth, but from your eyes and ears. There are re reports from physicians that people were so turning so dark blue from lack of oxygen in the blood, they referred to as cyanosis, uh, that they couldn't distinguish African Americans from whites. Uh, that, of course, spread rumors of the Black Plague from the Middle Ages. Uh, mm -hmm. It, you know, it, you know, and part of the terror was when you first got sick, you didn't know if you were going to have the same kind of ordinary influenza attack that we all recognize today, or whether it was going to develop into a lethal form. And you know, plus, uh, some of the deaths were were literally in a matter of hours. Uh, you know, people were well in the morning, went to work and died on the way home. Uh, so it, it was a pretty terrifying experience. And through all of that, do we have a sense of what the mortality rate is? That is of say a hundred people infected. Yeah. How many of them actually died? Yeah. Well, in the Western world where we have some decent statistics, the, uh, case mortality was probably, it ranged country to country and region to region, uh, but 
in general, probably around 2%. That's a little bit misleading because it depended on what the demographic was. Mm -hmm. For example, metropolitan life insurance had numbers that over 6% of all minors, not case mortality, mortality, over 6% of all the minors uh, in that, in the young adult or, you know, 18 to 45 died. Uh, pregnant women, there are studies that showed between 21 case mortality, between 21% and 71% uh, for pregnant women. Uh, in parts of the world that are referred to as virgin populations, people who had never seen any influenza virus, so their immune systems were totally vulnerable, uh, or they were totally vulnerable because the immune system didn't protect them. Uh, you could see anywhere from 10% to 30% of the entire population dead. Uh, in in s smaller villages, although some as large as three or 400, both in, in Africa and in Alaska, you occasionally found 100% mortality. Everybody died. Now, probably in those cases, they didn't all die of the disease. Probably they all got sick at the same time and there was nobody even to bring water to someone nobody provide any kind of service, uh, plus the psychological stress of seeing everyone around you dying. So that probably accounted for the mortal, 100% mortality as opposed to the virus directly. Now, you're describing some fairly remote places, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Eskimo villages and, and African uh, villages with, with just a few hundred people. And how did the virus get to these places? Uh, I, I assume that there had to be a, a human vector transmission Correct. Uh, at least in places like Alaska or Newfoundland, generally it was a male. Uh, in, in Africa, uh, I don't know exactly what the vector, well, who the vector, you know, whether it was, I, I, I don't know. But the uh, male. In, in, yeah, in North America, you could actually trace it uh, in most cases to post the delivery as a male. So was was this virus, were the particles um, able to survive on the mail, or was it that the carrier, the mail carriers were bringing it themselves? Well, actually, the virus, I mean, it was generally the mail carrier, mm -hmm. uh, the, the individual, because you can, you can think you're perfectly healthy, and, and still, uh, before you have any symptoms, you can infect someone else with influenza, unlike other diseases. For example, SARS. SARS threatened to become a pandemic, but it, by the same token, SARS, uh, you're not really infectious until you're really sick, meaning you're flat on your back, intubated, and you're, you're not walking around. Influenza is exactly the reverse. You're most infectious pretty early uh, in, in the disease, and you can certainly cause other people, transmit the disease when, when you have no symptoms or, or very early in, in the symptoms before you get really sick yourself. But the virus can, in fact, survive outside the body. And depending on the temperature and the humidity, it could go anywhere from uh, a couple hours to certainly more than a day. But that, again, that depends on temperature and humidity and what kind of surface it is. Now, in 1918, uh, I'm going to guess we didn't really even know what a virus was. And, and of course, this must have been one of the greatest medical mysteries of all time. And I'm sure uh, very intelligent people working very hard to figure it out. How, how did they how did they finally begin to, to um, contain it, control it and treat it? Because I've seen the pictures uh, that where there's just row after row of beds of sick people if they if they did manage to get to a treatment area. Um, so they were heavily concentrated. Of course, we had the troop carriers of World War One, all, all of these reasons for people to sort of be in proximity with each other. How did they begin to um, combat this or, or was there anything they could do? Well, I mean, the truth is there wasn't much they could do. Uh, I mean, the scientists at this time were a lot more sophisticated than I think most people today give them credit for. Uh, for example, uh, they developed, they, even though they didn't know what a virus was, whether it was a really, really, really small organism, just like a bacteria, or whether it was a completely different kind of organism, uh, 
they did, they called them filterable viruses because they could go through the smallest filters. Uh, but they, for example, proved that polio was a viral disease in 1908 and had a uh, vaccine that was 100% effective in preventing polio in monkeys by 1910. It wasn't until the 1950s that we had a vaccine that could protect uh, people. So the discovery of precisely what a virus was, was came out of research that began on influenza. It didn't occur to the 1920s. A few years later, a guy named Thomas Rivers. Uh, in, in terms of controlling it, uh, they didn't control it. Uh, it. It basically burned itself out. Uh, there was very little they could do. They did try, you know, they tried what today would be called social distancing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, suggesting that, you know, people keep their distance and so forth and so on, close schools, things like that. Uh, I don't think those things were very effective. And frankly, I, I think they'd be minimally effective today. I was uh, part of the planning process that came up with our, what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions. Uh, in other words, what do you do when you don't have drugs uh, in, 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 it, in how to mitigate another pandemic? And, you know, I'm, I'm relatively pessimistic as to how much impact they would have. They, they would do something, uh, but I, they certainly wouldn't control the outbreak of a disease. And then something like closing schools has a lot of repercussions uh, in the economy and everything else. So I think you would need a pretty lethal outbreak before it would make sense to even attempt to uh, do something to, like closing schools. Uh, then you have issues of uh, questions, you know, are, the, are these, you know, 12, 13 year old kids, are they going to go to the mall, are they going to go play basketball to, with each other, or are they just going to stay home? Uh, and if they're going to go out and meet each, with each other, then you don't have, you, you lose the benefits that you would have had, uh, most of them anyway, uh, from school closing. Uh, but that kind of stuff would do some minimal good. Uh, again, it depends how severe the disease would be as to how much sense it makes to implement uh, some of these things. Well, I'm interested in some of those other other steps, Sean, because I remember the SARS outbreak, um, and if my recollections are accurate, and, and perhaps any guide, I recall travel being impacted. I remember, uh, you know, uh, seeing right, pictures right, of empty right. malls, empty planes as people avoided public places, and even countries. And uh, everybody recently. wearing masks. Yeah. Every, first, I want to know if masks do any good. But second, I've been screened for temperature uh, on the last uh, two flu outbreaks ago when I was coming into another country uh, that, that did such things. Um, so, so they actually had a, a, a temperature portal that you walked through just to make sure the, you know, so anyway, do, would uh, is that a is could we not expect that sort of those sort of the, 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 you know there there are diseases for which some of those things would make sense like SARS, uh, you know because as I said earlier, uh, before someone can transmit SARS, they're generally pretty sick. Uh, I think for influenza, they're absolutely useless. In fact. Uh, a good friend of mine was Assistant Secretary of the Hum Health and Human Services and responsible for planning things like what the U.S. would do for pandemic. And at our U.S. airports, they didn't use any of those temperature things uh, for two reasons. Number one, they're not necessarily accurate. And number two, they're not going to catch someone who's health, who seems healthy, hasn't developed the symptoms yet, but is already carrying the virus. And... Uh, According to all the models, it doesn't really matter if, you know, one person, if it enters, you know, comes to a city and starts to spread the disease, or if 20 people start. And the reason is the, the virus uh, reproduces itself so rapidly uh, in just a few days. So uh, there has been modeling that said if we were to close borders, 99% effectively, then you would delay the arrival of a pandemic by two to three weeks. 
And if you were only 90% effective, it would only be a few days to a week, which is pointless. In addition, the economic disruption you would cause uh, would be astronomical. Just for an example, you know, when 2009, when this first seemed to surface in Mexico, uh, you know, I did a lot of media. People were asking me whether or not I supported closing the borders. I always said, absolutely no. Well, most of the chlorine that goes to water purification plants in the United States comes out of Mexico. And most of those plants don't have a very long show, you know, supply. So if you cut off the chlorine, then pretty soon people, you know, are going to be getting drinkable water. People will be dying of cholera and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, there are always these a uh, long chain of consequences to any action that you're going to take. You need to think through those. Uh, so uh, there are diseases where quarantine uh, makes sense. Influenza is not one of them. Uh, I'll give you the, some specific data. Which, unfortunately, it was never published. But there was a great pioneer epidemiologist named George Soper who uh, ended up doing the first head of the American Cancer Institute, did the first epidemiological surveys of cancer. Uh, he did a study of 120 army camps with uh, anywhere from two or 3,000 soldiers to uh, 60,000 soldiers. And 99 of those camps imposed quarantine. 21 did not. And he found no difference not simply not a statistically significant difference, but no difference between the camps between, that did and did not impose quarantine. Uh, that was statistically. However, he actually went in and did a qualitative assessment in addition to this straight quantitative assessment and discovered that the camps that very rigidly enforced the quarantine did in fact have some impact on the disease. Uh, spreading out and slowing down the the spread of the disease. The total morbidity remained about the same, but the stress on the hospitals and the camp and so forth was a lot less. So that would be worth doing. But the question is, if you cannot successfully quarantine a military camp in the middle of a war, how can you possibly quarantine a civilian society during peacetime? It's, it's just not doable. Uh, so a lot of the social measures uh, that people talk about, you know, at best they would they would just take a little bit of the top off uh, another outbreak. Now, one of the things you said at the very beginning of, uh, of the show, at the introduction was exactly right, uh, that we sh we often worry about the wrong things, and influenza is a perfect example. There is a lot of work that is ongoing uh, to develop a so-called universal influenza vaccine, a vaccine that will work against all influenza viruses. You know, earlier I said that it mutates, one of the fastest mutating viruses in existence, and, and that's why you need a different vaccine every year. Even so, the most effective vaccine we have ever developed for influenza is only 62% effective. Lots of times, most of the time, it's 30, 40% effective. Now, about 15 years ago, when West Nile first surfaced, we were spending more money on West Nile than we were spending to develop an influenza vaccine. The worst year in American history in terms of deaths from West Nile was about three or 400 people killed. Whereas influenza was killing between 3,000 and 56,000 Americans a year. Right. And yet we were spending more money on West Nile. Uh, it's just nuts, you know, where, where people send, you know, you know, set their priorities. Well, exactly. So uh, let me, a um, couple clarifications in there then. Um, when you say uh, numbers like 75% or 36% effective, what does that mean? Does that mean um, that? that uh, somebody who got it would be impacted less or that only 36% of the people, and if that's the number, were, were uh, uh, protected? Uh, that's a good question. And what that number means is that you are less, you know, if it's 40% effective, then you are 40% less likely 
to get the disease than if you had not gotten the vaccination. Uh, in term, it does do probably further good in terms of giving you some protection so that your illness will not be as severe as it might otherwise be. That, that's pretty hard to quantify severity uh, of illness that, you know, they, they do think it does cut down on severity. So that is another benefit. Uh, the reality is so many people are get influenza and it is potentially lethal. As many as 56,000 Americans die in a bad year uh, for influenza, according to CDC. Uh, so, you know, with, with tens of millions of Americans get it, even if you, it's only 40% effective, it is still well worth getting the vaccine. Plus the additional benefit, which you mentioned, uh, which is supposed, but I don't know that it's quantified in terms of less severity. Right, right. So l- I want to get to um, a-, a couple of key pieces here in the time we have remaining. But but to get there, I think uh, I'd like your help in uh, explaining something. When, when we're talking about flu strains, uh, this comes up every year, H this and that, like H3N2. Right. What John, what do these letters and numbers mean? Well, the, those are the, the two... Uh, molecules that stick out in the outside of the virus. The H is a hemagglutinin and the N is called neuraminidase. And there are 18 different subtypes of hemagglutinin and nine neuraminidase. So if you have an H1N1 virus, then that is, you know, type number one hemagglutinin, type number one neuraminidase. It, the uh, threat out there at the moment that seems most worrisome is H7N9, uh, which is a virus that's circulating in China and has about a 60% mortality rate. Uh, we're obviously concerned that that will uh, you know, become more transmissible between humans and could spark a pandemic. Uh, in 2000, and actually in 1997, H5N1 surfaced. We were very worried about that. That seems that still circulates and is still killing at roughly 50, 60 percent case mortality. Uh, but there are a lot fewer cases of H5N1. That was the year when, you know, in 2004, when it resurfaced, it was known as bird flu. Um, got that name. And H7N9 is also another bird flu. But as I said at the beginning, you know, all influenza viruses are really bird flu because they all start on in birds. Uh, but the names of the subtypes are actually less uh, concerning because the subtypes themselves, for example, the 1918 virus was H1N1 and the 2009 virus was H1N1. They shared some similarities and yet the 2009 virus if we didn't have modern molecular biology and modern surveillance, uh, it looked like a mild influenza year, although it was a pandemic compared to 1918, where you have 50 to 100 million deaths. Uh, and they're both H1N1 viruses. So that subtype is, is yeah, well, you, I think you understand the point I'm making. Sure. And that, that 2009 H1N1, that was, I remember that as swine flu. Um, and the numbers I have in that, it killed maybe 200,000 people worldwide, which, which, uh, again, not, not overly, uh, uh, bad as far as these things go. If, if the United States alone is, uh, maybe 59,000 was a number you quoted before. So, but looking at this H7N9 that is circulating in China and you mentioned it's, uh, you know, these horizon birds. So I'm thinking of all the contact that we have now, if you imagine a farm, you know, like you have all these farms all over the world, but in China in particular, where you have all these uh, geese and ducks and chickens, and you got all these pig farms. It just feels like that's a that's literally a petri dish for allowing these viruses to uh, you know run through their mutation patterns. It seems like there's a greater and greater chance of human animal bird flu virus sort of contact. And yet, 1918 was the year one of these things popped out. Uh, is is there is there some explanation for that, um, or is it or is that just luck of the draw? Yeah, well. Number one, you're right on both counts. You know, there is much more possibility today and much more interaction today. Uh, and, but number two, uh, it was just bad luck of the draw in right. 1918. Right. 
So, you know, both things are, are true. Uh, I think everybody was looking to Asia uh, for the emergence of the next pandemic, and then it occurred in Mexico, although I think the first cases were actually identified in San Diego. Uh, the, you know, where the next one comes from, it, it, you know, it, it's random. Uh, I think the only thing we can be certain of is that there will be another pandemic and another one after that is the nature of the virus. You know, how lethal it is, that's unknown. Whether or not we will have a universal influenza vaccine uh, before the next one hits, that's unknown. Uh, as I said earlier, there is a lot of work going on on that. You know, it really started after the bird flu scare in 2004. Uh, and got another uh, push forward in 2009. Uh, there's been enough work done on it to suggest that it is possible, if not even, you know, more than possible, that it's probable that we can eventually develop one. Uh, but, and what it would do would be, it would target parts of the virus that don't mutate much. Uh, you know, as I said it, a while back, 99% of the virus particles produced in our cell are not uh, viruses. They cannot function. They can't infect another cell and reproduce. Uh, but that's because the different, the whole parts of the virus uh, have mutated. But that 1%, there is a certain elements of the virus that have to remain pretty constant or it won't work. So if you target those areas of virus with a vaccine, uh, that's how you get a universal vaccine. It does seem probable. Well, that, that's, that seems uh, very hopeful, and we'll keep an eye out for that. In the meantime, I'm wondering um, if, so, so I was a little shocked, you know, you said that uh, the overall mortality rate for the Spanish flu of 1918, 2%, but if you looked within subclassifications within the, the young and the healthy, within the, the immunologically strong, might have been 6 or 7%. You just quoted a number for the age 7 and 9 of, of 10 times that practically. Uh, um, so uh, if something like that came along, what would you personally do uh, given that? Um, what, how, would you, how would you alter your life if in any ways at all? Well, first, let me explain why it's so lethal. Uh, the normal influenza virus that we are subjected to all the time, that virus will only bind to your upper respiratory tract. Uh, the 1918 virus could bind both, both to your, and because it binds to your upper respiratory tract, then it is easily communicable to other people. You cough, you sneeze, and so forth. The 1918 virus could bind both to cells on your upper respiratory tract, so it was easily communicable, but it also could bind to cells deep in the lung. So when that happened, you were basically starting out with viral pneumonia, which is not a good place to start. Hmm. Uh, the bird flu viruses, which are H5N1 and H7N9, they are not communicable between people because they can only bind to cells that are already deep in the lung. So they're, they do not transmit from one person to another, but if you get sick, then you're starting out with viral pneumonia. Uh, so if there were a pandemic that would be caused by those viruses, it would have to acquire the ability to bind to the upper respiratory tract as well. So you would probably have a situation similar to 1918. Uh, it was not exactly, <laughs> not exactly hopeful, mm -hmm. but the mortality rate would not be 50 or 60 percent. It would drop a lot lower than that, probably be in the range of, of 1918. But you're still talking about tens of millions and possibly more than several hundred million deaths. Uh, so that's beyond horrific. Again, this would all happen in a period of a few months. Uh, it would take that, you know, so again, a, a completely horrific situation. Uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that word understates. <laughs> but, uh, in terms of what I would do, if there's a vaccine available, I would take it. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 
a couple of antiviral drugs, which have only modest effect, uh, but they do have some effect. Uh, in terms of after you're infected, there is called oseltamivir. I probably blew the pronunciation. Uh, uh, they have to be taken very soon after you first have a symptom. If they're taken more than 48 hours after your symptoms, they're probably not going to have any effect impact at all. But if you take them immediately, they can be useful. Uh, they also may be useful prophylactically. In terms of so-called social distancing, if you can completely sequester yourself from the rest of the world, uh, then you could have a good chance of protecting yourself. But the sequestration has to be complete and it has to be sustained for uh, at least six or eight weeks. Uh, it would take that long, probably more than six weeks, at least eight to 10 weeks for the virus to burn through a particular community. At least that's that's what happened in, in 1918 and other pandemics. It was kind of a rolling thing. It would come to one city and, and somewhere between eight to 10 weeks later it would pretty much have infected everybody who's going to be infected uh, and then move on. So it, it would be difficult to avoid. <laughs> Very difficult. What about the just a standard N95 dust mask? I see people wearing those in China. Well, an N95, particular. I think, can be useful. However, uh, you know, they have to be worn very well. Very, You have to put them on properly for them mm-hmm. to be effective at all. That's number one. Number two, they're not very comfortable. Mm-hmm. Uh, you start adjusting them and they use lose their impact. Number three... You have to be very careful when you take them off. Uh, most of the SARS deaths were healthcare workers. It is, it is uh, hypothesized that most of them infected themselves when they took off their what's called PPEs, personal protective equipment, because uh, they got a little careless. Hmm. Uh, it, the very first meeting that we had on pandemic preparedness uh, in terms of developing you know, social distancing measures and the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions, what you can do when you don't have a vaccine or drug to mitigate a pandemic. We had the infection control officer from the Hong Kong hospital who was most, uh, it was a hospital with by far the best safety rate and the fewest healthcare workers infected. And he made a presentation and basically sounded like Vince Lombardi locking and tackling. It's all Hmm. fundamentals. Hmm. Everybody knows what to do to protect themselves, or at least all these professional healthcare workers knew what to do when they took off their equipment and how to protect themselves. It's, you know, a matter of, you know, but but, primarily washing hands and things like that. But uh, they got a little bit sloppy. And what he did in his hospital was absolutely insist and rigorously monitor the standard safety safety precautions that every single hospital or modern hospital in the world is familiar with. But he made sure they actually did it. And just a little bit of casualness and and how you treat these things, and they infected themselves. So in terms of N95 masks and the general population, if they're worn properly, which is not as easy as it sounds, and if they're disposed of or taken off properly, then then they would provide some protection. Uh, but as a widespread measure for the general population, I don't, I, you know, it would be difficult. I mean, worth doing, worth doing, but difficult. And uh, you know, surgical masks, you've got to differentiate between an N95 and a surgical mask. A surgical mask will be useless, Mm -hmm. uh, except in one instance. And and even in 1918, uh, they were familiar with the fact that if you put a mask on somebody who's sick, then that will protect people around the sick person. You know, will a mother put a mask, a surgical mask on a sick child and make that child suffer a little bit more? I don't know, but if the mother is convinced 
it will protect other people in the house, including her other kids, then she's much more likely to do that. Um, but in terms of walking around on the street, uh, a surgical mask would be absolutely useless in my view. Mm. I, I completely understand that. And, uh, uh, you know, as part of my training, I did a lot of work in um, clean hoods, you know, so I did a lot of cell biological work. And I also worked with radiological materials. And as part of my training, uh, they would make us, you know, pipette things from little vials across. And one of the things we did was we would pipette fluorescein, the super highly concentrated um, uh, fluorescent material. And so you'd do the very best you could, you'd pipette it very carefully and move from one to the next. And you're absolutely sure I was certain on my first few times that I was absolutely careful, I hadn't spilled a thing and then you get the black light out and it looks like a crime scene in there you know there's like stuff all over the place yeah. right it's very yeah. very difficult yeah. to to um, operate in a clean way and so what i came away with from that experience though was that i learned that direct touch was important and so i learned to train myself in flu seasons like if i put my hand on a banister or i get a doorknob i will not touch my mucosal membranes on my eyes or my nose or my mouth um, with it before I've washed my hands. And I found I've had pretty good success keeping myself healthy, but it takes a real consciousness and it's very difficult to do, um, you know, well and consistently if it's not your habit already. Um, so, so that was sort of my experience with this is that I, I, I think that, you know, it, it is possible to um, limit your exposure, but you have to, you really have to know what you're doing and you got to be careful with it. And, and, you ha- and you have to do it every time. Every time. Every time. And I was just reading, but you know, this is just how serious this is, is that uh, I was reading about uh, two case studies. There was one hospital that had much, much worse infection rates uh, post-surgery. And by, by the time they'd finally parsed it all the way through, I'm sure you know where I'm going with this, John, they discovered that they'd gotten sloppy with hand washing there in the hospital with yeah. a high infection rate. Like, hand washing for a surgeon, this should be the simplest, most routine thing you could possibly do. And still it's hard to maintain that, apparently. Blocking and tackling, I guess I'm sorry. Some, some households do it right, and, you know, it's, it, uh, yeah. I, and it, on that kind of thing, infections after surgery, I mean, there's no reason that every hospital in the country doesn't have a great rate. And, right. you know, what, there are some very significant differences in, in some hospital infection rates, and there's no justification for that. It's just carelessness. Absolutely. So if you were going to give a, a, a sort of a letter grade or however you'd want to a, a rate this, how do you think we where, where does the where does the world stand in terms of its readiness for the next pandemic? Um, how about an, uh, somewhere between an E and an F? <laughs> <laughs> an F minus me? Oh, right. E and F. Uh, why, why is that? <laughs> well, one thing we haven't even discussed uh, is supply chains uh, and the economic impact yeah. and so forth and so on. Uh, you know, outside the healthcare system, uh, you know, if you have your air traffic control, you've got 20, 30 percent of your air traffic controllers sick at the same time. Uh, what's that going to do to your economy? If you have, you know, mo- you, I think most of the power plants in the United States are still still coal powered. Mm-hmm. Uh, they get their coal, most of them from. Wyoming, you see these enormous trains uh, you fly over sometimes. And, you know, suppose all those, that's a highly skilled position, those engineers uh, moving trains that are a mile long, a mile and a half long. Uh, Suppose they're out, then you're not going to have power uh, in in many of the power plants. Things that you don't automatically think of as relating to a pandemic, even a, a mild one that makes a lot of people sick without killing them, then you have the economic impact. Uh, you have most of the, to, to get to the healthcare system directly, you know, practically all the antibiotics uh, are imported. And you interrupt those supply chains and then you start getting people who are dying from diseases that other unrelated to influenza that, you know, they would otherwise uh, survive. Or we had a small example of that uh, with saline solution bags, which were produced in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, because of the hurricane, was no longer producing them. So we had tremendous shortages 
in the last since since the hurricane last year in those bags other suppliers worldwide have picked up the slack so that's not a problem today but in a pandemic you're going to have supply chain issues like that simultaneously all over the world so you're not going to be able to call on any reserve anywhere because everybody's going to be in the same situation you know whether you talk about hypodermic needles or plastic gloves you know any of that stuff uh we, you know we are the supply chain issues in a moderate pandemic where again it, a lot of people are sick but not necessarily dying you know there there that's a real problem uh and if you get a severe pandemic i mean plus uh, the, the the hospitals can't cope. They, there are much fewer hospital beds per capita than there used to be because everything has gotten efficient. Mm-hmm. And in a normal uh, influenza season, like or a bad one like last year, many many hospitals around the country, you know, were were so overwhelmed they all but closed their emergency rooms and, and weren't taking any more patients uh, for any reason. Uh, there is just no slack in the system. And what efficiency does is eliminate as much as possible what is considered waste, but that waste is, is slack. And when you have a surge in something, you need that slack to take care of the surge. So, you know, uh, you know, if I were grading generously, I would give us a D. You know, all right. In terms of uh, in terms of overall preparedness, if we were to have a universal influenza vaccine, you know, maybe we'd be oh, relatively okay. But but we don't. Well, in the absence of that, you know, part of the thing that I talk with uh, to my audience about is the need for uh, self reliance and and being prepared and and understanding that if these supply chain disruptions, I mean, if you mentioned that there's a six to eight week burn cycle as this uh, you know, pandemic sort of sweeps through a territory, if we lost twenty percent of our truckers, there would be food shortages and innumerable other things would be difficult to predict. If if global trade even stuttered for a week or two weeks, there would be all these ripples going through that would be impossible to predict, but some would be relatively straightforward. Um, we would just have breakdowns in certain supply chains, the longer and more fragile and the more, uh, just in time they're, they're sort of navigating their inventory stash at, uh, you know, no buffers, no reserves. So I think it's incumbent on individuals to have their own, uh, reserves and, and ability. And you, you raised a great point. I was in California this May doing our yearly seminar. And when I was there, the, the, the they were having their flu was sort of at the peak there. And uh, the headlines in the local papers were about how the hospitals were triaging into tents out in the parking lot that they had to set up, right? Yeah. And that's just yeah. on a relatively ordinary flu cycle, or maybe just, you know, worst in the last 10 years, I guess. But still, when I look at the charts, it doesn't look that out of out of range, um, all things considered. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, let me make my final point, I guess, also. Sure. Uh, I think the public health sector has a pretty good idea of what it should do and if there's a pandemic you know even though i'm you know been been pessimistic and you know, uh, in terms of how much impact it would have the recommendations would have some impact there's no question but to get a political figure to pay attention to a public health professional that is where there is a huge gap hmm. Uh, we saw that in 2009 where countries were acting irrationally. I mean, not just, you know, China, the Chinese health minister announced that it was a foreign disease. He was going to keep it out of China. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, the French wanted the European Union to cancel all flights to Mexico. Enormous economic disruption with virtually no benefit. Uh, you know, there are other countries around where Egypt slaughtered basically every pig in the country. As you said, that was called swine flu. Mm-hmm. Uh, we saw uh, ridiculous political responses again in Ebola uh, a couple of years ago. So does anyone think, even if you have a, a listeners who are Trump supporters, 
do they really believe that Trump is going to listen to a public health professional if there's a pandemic and, and, and take care of his advice? Or is he going to do something from his gut that is very likely going to like close borders and, and end up cutting off supplies of chlorine to water purification plants and things like that? Uh, and not just Trump. I mean, uh, uh, again, we haven't really seen many rational responses when there have been threats uh, f- from countries. So I think that's maybe the thing that worries me among the most. I don't know about the most. There are plenty of things to worry about. But the, the gap between a politician who's actually making a decision and the public health professional who's trying to get him to make the right him or her to make the right decision. You know, we certainly didn't see that in Ebola, uh, really, in any country in the world. Understood and very well said. And everybody, we've been talking with John Barry, author of The Great Influenza, the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, author of many other fantastic books. John, uh, what are you working on next and and uh, what can we look forward to coming from you next? Well, it won't be out for a few years, but uh, hmm. uh, as you may know, uh, Louisiana has lost roughly 2,000 square miles of land yeah. in the last uh, 70 years or so. I live in New Orleans. Uh, I was on the post-Katrina levy board, uh, very involved in those issues. So I'm writing a book essentially about everything that's gone into making uh, the Louisiana coast disappear. And uh, hopefully, <laughs> you know, how, to, how New Orleans has a chance to survive if it can survive, things like that. Another cheery subject. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, but very important. John, thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it, as, I, as I'm as i certain all my listeners do as well. Okay, well, you're very welcome. I enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>